We are back on the record in the case of the state versus Ms. Williams. All counsel are present. Ms. Williams is present. We are here for closings, but I just wanted to verify that all evidence is in from both sides. Is that accurate? Correct, Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor. Very well. You have no time restrictions. I'm here to listen. You may proceed, sir. May it please the court. Yes. Your Honor, we are here today because of this defendant's callous disregard for the law and her decision to inflict a lifetime of pain upon an innocent family. And, you know, we spent the last two days dealing with the emotions surrounding this kidnapping and the pain that this woman has inflicted. I think it's critical for Your Honor's analysis of what the proper thing to do is in this case is to examine, you know, what is the purpose of sentencing and what are our laws that we all agree to share? What do those laws say about sentencing and what Your Honor should consider in deciding what is appropriate? So I want to go over what the primary purposes of sentencing is. And our Florida Criminal Punishment Code tells us very clearly that the primary purpose of sentencing is to punish the offender. And I would suggest to Your Honor that that should be your prime focus in deciding what to do in this particular case. It should be punishment. And that is what I think Your Honor needs to focus on the most. I want to go through a few others. Of course, Your Honor should also uh, be cognizant of what your sentence will do in terms of protecting the public. Your Honor should be cognizant of what your sentence will do to publicly renounce crime, to make it a deterrence, to make sure that the citizens of our community understand that certain behavior cannot be tolerated. I do think that is a primary purpose of sentencing to make the victims whole, to make the victims understand that justice and the justice system is there to work for them to make sure that they are whole as a result of the crime. <coughs> and finally, rehabilitation. But as our criminal punishment code indicates, Your Honor, rehabilitation is secondary. It is a secondary goal and is subordinate to the goal, the primary goal of punishment. So these five factors, I think, are what the court should consider in determining what an appropriate sentence is. And if I could just get you to pause for a moment. I want to verify the defense can see the state's PowerPoint. We can, Your Honor. Okay, thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you may you, proceed, Honor. sir. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the sentencing guidelines. You know, we, uh, you've heard, Your Honor, a lot in this court about what the maximum, the, the defendant should receive the maximum is. Well, as the court is well aware, kidnapping carries with it a punishment up to life imprisonment. Now, the, uh, so that's the maximum. So the concept that 22 years is, not, is the maximum is actually false. Uh, 22 years was a negotiated disposition reached into by the parties based primarily on the fact that sentencing guidelines were in place at the time of this crime. Because the defendant committed this crime three months before the criminal punishment code was passed, the defendant gets the benefit of those sentencing guidelines that were in place July of 1998. Those sentencing guidelines called for a sentence of 50.7 months to 84.5 months. Again, 84.5 months was not the maximum. The statutory maximum was life in prison. But because the defendant was willing to take responsibility and accountability for her actions by pleading and uh, forego the need of a trial and the defendant was willing to waive the upper end of these guidelines to go all the way to 22 years, the state felt it was in the best interest of the state of Florida as well as the victims to entertain that plea and enter into it. But those guidelines, Your Honor, existed had the defendant returned the victim an hour later a day later, a week later, a month later, a year later, the guidelines would have been 50.7 months to 84.5 months. They don't change because kidnapping is an ongoing crime. But the fact that it's ongoing, the court should consider the harm and the length of time that, that this particular kidnapping was in considering whether 84.5 months is appropriate and or all the way up to 22 years. Your Honor, 
for argument's sake, we can assume that if you would have taken 16 separate counts of kidnapping, in other words, if the state were able legally, which it cannot, but if the state were legally able to charge 16 counts of kidnapping for every year that the defendant was interfering with the rightful mother's custody of this child, the guidelines would be 46.4 years to life. I show this not because those are what the guidelines are, but I show this because I think it's very instructive to the court about what the sentencing guidelines feel the harm that this defendant inflicted upon this family, how severe this kidnapping was because it occurred over such a long period of time. And I think it's very instructive to the court to think of we, how we as a society would feel about 16 separate one-year counts of kidnapping. And that's what our society would say about the potential sentence. And I understand your argument is by analogy, but there was only one count of kidnapping brought. Right. And only one legally could be brought. Right. Okay. But, as I indicated, the, the count of kidnapping would have been the exact same had she returned the child the next day, the next month, the next year. So it's certainly, I think, instructive for the court to see what the guidelines would be had the, the state been able to charge 16 separate counts. Um, also, Your Honor, I think it's important because uh, there, every crime is not created equal. And that is why I, 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 you know, we have agreed to a sentencing structure that allows courts to consider, and juries to consider, how crimes are different. And those are based on aggravating factors and mitigating factors. And I want to examine some of the aggravating factors the state submits exist in this case, and then examine the lack of mitigating factors that exist in this case. <clears throat> As the court is aware, one of the uh, most egregious aggravating factors is that the crime was committed in a cold, calculated, and premeditated manner. And in fact, if a crime is done like that, our courts uh, and our legal system says that that crime can actually be punishable by death if it's a homicide. And it is still a, an aggravator for the courts to consider. And this crime was about as heightened premeditation, about as cold, about as calculated as any kidnapping could ever be. This woman drove from her town, mind you, having lost, allegedly, a baby months earlier. She drove through the state of South Carolina, the state of Georgia, all the way down to Florida, okay, just so happened to find a hospital right off of the road, parked that car, went directly to the maternity ward, found herself a teenage mother, engaged that mother for not seconds. She didn't run in there and grab the baby and run out. She engaged this woman for hours, trying to deceive her and then later her grandmother, um, her mother-in-law, the child's grandmother, so she could abduct this child. She brought with her a car seat in the back of that car that sat there, evidence of the cold, calculated, and premeditated nature of the crime. She wore scrubs, evidence of the cold, calculated, and premeditated nature of the crime. She brought a bag into that hospital room and actually placed that child in the bag, knowing full well that she was doing something illegal, evidence of the cold, calculated, and premeditated nature. The fact that she could have cared less for the well-being of that child and cared only for her getting away with this crime. Stuffing a newborn infant in a bag. That cold, calculated, and premeditated action continued when she drove home and showed off her brand new baby. All the smiles, all the joys, all the attention on her. That shows you the character of this woman. Not the words that everyone said about what a good person she was, but her actions show you her character, show you what her soul is. It goes beyond that, Your Honor. Faking birth certificates. I think the court, if the court can see the PowerPoint up there, Your Honor. I do. This was seized from the defendant's home by police officers. A forged birth certificate indicating that she is the birth mother of Alexis Manigault, all made up, completely forged. Fake social security cards, again seized in the defendant's house, with photographs that it's just so chilling to see 
how long this crime happened. We have a photograph of a fake social security guard, social security card, along with a, you know, a four or five year old Kamaya Mobley and a graduated Kamaya Mobley. How cold, how calculated, and how premeditated this crime was. This defendant actually took the little bassinet identity cards that are placed in the hospital cribs, little bassinets. And you could, the court could see that this was also seized from her house. And she actually forged it to show that Glory is the mother and Manigo is the baby. She kept this as a memento of her crime. Not out of remorse. You keep these kind of things out of pride. She was happy with what she had done. Cold, calculated, and premeditated. And it continued for 18 years. The crime was heinous, atrocious, or cruel to the victim and her family, and the pain continued for 18 years. Now, the state's not in any way, shape, or form suggesting that while Alexis Manigo believed that her family was her family, that pain was inflicted upon her. But certainly pain has been inflicted upon her unknowingly because every childhood memory this, this poor child has experienced was based on a crime, was based on fraud, was based on brainwashing, was based on a lie. But obviously the court saw what this family had to endure, what this family had to experience, and the heinous, atrocious, and cruel nature of this crime. And it continues today. Shannara Mobley and Craig Aiken find out after 18 years, really beyond hope, the fact that they maintained hope that long, I think, is incredible. I'm not so sure I could have done that, but they did. They maintained hope that one day they would see their child again. And when that moment comes, and they're so thrilled and so happy, but what they can't prepare themselves for is the person responsible for all their pain has tricked, lied, brainwashed, <coughs> their child into believing that she's a good person, into believing that she's a mother. And the pain continues today. For every time that Kamaya Mobley reaches out to her family, and it's not her fault, I'm not blaming her, she was tricked into this. But every time that Kamaya Mobley reaches out <coughs> to the people that raised her, it's another dagger in the heart of this family, knowing that the people responsible <coughs> are still closer to Kamaya Mobley than her biological parents are. So the heinous, you atrocious... Said people responsible? I'm sorry, what, Yeah. You said people responsible? No, I'm saying, well, the, the people that the child still loves are responsible for the daggers, not really of their doing, of the defendants. But if the relationship continues with the grandparents and the uncles and the cousins and all that stuff, each one of those relationships is another dagger in the heart of the biological parents because the person responsible is the one that they, she still maintains a relationship with. You know, these are photographs of the defendant apparently at her baby shower. And then just six weeks after bringing Kamaya Mobley home. And you can see the joy on her face at both of those. And all the while this joy is going on is Shannara Mobley's anguish. The fact that you have a mother and a father and a grandmother and an aunt and uncles and cousins all anguishing under the heinous, atrocious, and cruel nature. And don't for a second think that this defendant didn't realize that. She was a mother well before all this happened, and she knew the pain that she was inflicting upon another family. She just didn't care. And that, Your Honor, is heinous, atrocious, and cruel. I can't even begin to imagine what this photograph, with a fake name, does 
to Shannara Mobley, Craig Aiken, and the rest of that family. Because every parent thinks about the graduation of their child. And that was robbed from them by her. 18 years of heinous, atrocious, and cruel conduct by this defendant. The defendant knowingly created harm to an entire community. Your Honor, my first son was born just three months after, two and a half months after this crime. And I know that it completely changed the way that hospitals in Northeast Florida, perhaps throughout the state and the country, treated maternity wards. And I know that the whole community was devastated with the concept that we can live in a society where someone and that someone turned out to be high functioning, not crazy, not you know, under the influence of some delusion, not uneducated, but a seemingly normal person can walk into a hospital room and steal somebody's baby. And I would submit there was not a mother or father that for the days, months, weeks, years after this incident, that knew about this incident, that wasn't in the back of their minds wondering whether or not this was going to happen to them. This was not an isolated crime that had little effect upon our community. It was a devastating crime that had an effect on our entire community. And it had a devastating effect upon her family. Now she's trying to say sorry now, and I'm sure they forgive her because they love her. But Your Honor, it's very disturbing when, the, when you see 76-year-old parents that need her, and yet she didn't think about them at all for 18 years, and then tries to use their frailty as a reason why she shouldn't go to prison. That's her responsibility. And she, can't, she wants to use it now when she didn't think about that for 18 years, about the harm she was doing to her family, that her parents were going to need her one day, and she knew it to her own testimony. She was going to get caught one day. She didn't care. This was a selfish act by a selfish woman that destroyed an entire community, including her own family, including the poor, innocent child that we all... We all recognize the difficulty that she's going through. And frankly, I think she's going to be fine. My interactions with Kamaya are she's a strong woman and probably doesn't like all the sympathy she receives. Um, but, you know, she shouldn't be spending this part of her life worrying about this stuff. Right now, she should be thinking about her summer break, not sitting in a courtroom wondering where she fits in to this whole process. The defendant's actions cost the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office and the Federal Bureau of Investigation countless hours that could have been used to solve and permit, prevent other crimes. We have a finite amount of resources, Your Honor, and as Detective McKean testified to, a tremendous amount of resources was spent on this case that could have been spent to solve other crimes or prevent other crimes or put people away that needed to put needed to be put away so other families wouldn't be crying. You know, the, the resources, I mentioned a couple of times during Detective McKean's testimony that this was homicide. Because this was a missing baby and it was such an important case, the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office put their best investigative teams on it. It wasn't missing person, it was homicide like this. And so what does homicide do? Take people that kill and bring them up to justice, get them off the streets. Well, instead of doing that, they're searching for her because of her own selfishness. And obviously we can't quantify if one murder could have been solved. But, Your Honor, I submit that that goes to the aggravating part of this defendant's actions, that not only did she do this to a community as a whole and to this family, but she distracted law enforcement. $250,000 reward. Kamaya Mobley, everyone's looking for. And there's Kamaya Mobley's photograph on the refrigerator of the defendant's house. It's amazing how strikingly similar they are. 
She knew what she was doing. The victim was less than 12 years of age. Now, of course, that is a strong aggravating factor for when the court hears about sex crimes against children, homicides against children, child abuse, aggravated child abuse against children, the fact that the child is so vulnerable. But in this case, I want Your Honor to think about the fact that this defendant knew that she was creating she was reaching a point of no return once this child became four or five years old because she was creating a bond between a mother and daughter that could never be undone. And she continued to inflict that. Had she returned Kamaya Mobley within the first year, I would submit Kamaya Mobley wouldn't have known the difference. That's probably through two years, three years, maybe four years. But they reached a point where Kamaya Mobley would have known the difference would have remembered the fact that she was kidnapped. So you're talking about knowingly inflicting a kidnapping upon a child five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, and then twelve years old, inflicting, knowingly inflicting this brainwashing, this lie, this fraud upon this child. Knowing that she's not only destroying the life of the parent, but she's contributing to an undefined harm upon this child. Your Honor, I, I can't even begin to wrap my brain around the following two photos. <clears throat> we found this in the defendant's house and the defendant went through the process of obtaining an identification and I dent a kid of Kamaya Mobley just five years after she took Kamaya Mobley, got her fingerprint on the back of that card, and kept that card with instructions about what to do if someone takes your kid. If that is not aggravating, if that doesn't make this crime worthy of the highest possible punishment, I don't know what else could. We spent the last two days here listening to memories, precious photographs, precious moments that this defendant had and her family had with Kamaya Mobley. You know, it's the little ones. I think it was Kamaya Mobley's brother, uh, her fraudulently obtained brother, because it's not a biological brother. That he had these memories of Skittles, I forget what the exact story is, these little precious moments that he'll always remember with his sister. And they all came in here and said wonderful things about the defendant. But I wondered if Kamaya Mobley had committed some crime and she was on trial or she had pled guilty of some crime, and we were to bring her biological parents in to say a few nice words or share a few memories of the kind of person that Kamaya Mobley was, I'm afraid that they would be speechless. Because they don't have a Skittles memory. They don't have any of those memories. And that's what was forever robbed from them. This crime could not be any more aggravating. But let's examine some mental factors, some mitigating factors, things that the court may consider in determining that maybe she doesn't deserve as much time as the state is asking for. Did the defendant have some mental condition? I mean, she tried to say that on the witness stand that she, she didn't know and she wasn't in her right state of mind. But that condition that she claimed that she wasn't in her right state of mind had zero effect on every other aspect of her life. So there's no way I submit to your honor you can consider that as any kind of mitigating factor. She was working, she got degrees, she volunteered in churches over and over again. If you, if you took out the kidnapping, she sounds like she's the woman of the year. So I submit to you 
that you cannot consider any kind of mental mitigation in this case. Because first of all, none has been proven to you. And second of all, it cannot be a mental condition if she succeeds in every other part of her life. Of course, the other argument is she gave the stolen child a good childhood. And there's nothing that makes me more upset in this argument. The fact that she did right by this child, that somehow that is a mitigating factor. Your Honor, the most important gift we give our children is not presents at Christmas, candy at Halloween, dresses on their birthday. That's not a parent's job. A parent's job, the gift that is most important that we give a child is a moral soul. It's to teach our children that you should do unto others as you would have them do unto you. You do that through your words and you do that through your example. More importantly, through your example. So to claim, to have the gall, to claim that this woman did right by this child is disgusting. It's infuriating and it's wrong. It's wrong because she didn't do right by this child. She destroyed the concept of trust, the concept of security. Parents are gods to their children. And Kamaya finds out that her God's a liar. What about the genetic connection? What about a sister? What about a brother that shares the same smile, the same eyes, the same hair, the same run, the same laugh? Things that siblings should be able to share with each other, stolen from her. It's not mitigating that she gave her a good childhood. She could not give her a good childhood because it was all based on a lie. I also expect you to hear that Kamaya doesn't want, want time, and God bless that child for that feeling, because you know what? It's an honorable feeling, and I, the state of Florida has no quarrel with Kamaya Mobley's uh, feelings. I don't know how she can feel any other way. But to say that, that somehow mitigates your honor's decision? A kidnapper should not benefit by her own brainwashing into convincing this child that she is a good mother. She shouldn't benefit by that. And she should not benefit by Kamaya's strength in recognizing that this is a hard time for her entire family, not just her mother. She shouldn't benefit from Kamaya Mobley's strength. The kidnapper was a good person, you know, Saying that this woman is a good person is like saying that Mussolini was a good leader because he got the trains to the station on time. And you ignore the giant Grand Canyon of a crime that this woman did. You can't be a good person and kidnap a baby. Those are incongruent. That cannot be a mitigating factor. She is not a good person. Her act was the definition of evil. There is nothing about what you've heard the last two days that in any way, shape, or form mitigates this case. When you analyze the five purposes of sentencing, Your Honor, I suggest to you that all five of those point to giving this defendant 22 years in Florida State Prison. Mind you, this is a legal argument. 22, 22 years in Florida State Prison, which, mind you, was already reduced from the life in prison. To give this defendant any less, Your Honor, I submit to you is not following what the purpose of sentencing is. Because giving less than 22 years is saying, well, maybe stealing babies out of hospitals is not such a bad thing. Well, she did cry on the witness stand, and she seemed to go to church sometimes, so... Maybe I shouldn't punish her as much as I should punish her. So I think if your honor is true to what the spirit of our Florida state statutes and the sentencing structure that we have, 22 years is the only logical 
unemotional and just sentence you can impose in this case. But if your honor wants some emotion, to be in your children's memories tomorrow, you need to be in their lives today. Robbed, stolen, kidnapped by this defendant. And the end of the day, at the end of the day, all that matters is love and memory. So make sure you give it and make sure you make them. This is what our lives are important. I think every human being in the world would trade any monetary gain for just one moment with their child, a hug, a, a, a smile to brighten their lives. Because that's really what matters in life. This is Shannara Mobley's beautiful family. I love the steps from youngest to oldest. But that photograph has a missing person, Your Honor. That missing person is a person that should be in that photograph, that should be right between Shannara Mobley and what she had raised for this whole time as her oldest daughter. When they're sitting around celebrating Grandpa's birthday, Kamaya Mobley should have been standing right there. When the kids are sitting around the Christmas tree, opening up presents, wondering what Santa brought them, Kamaya Mobley should have been right there. And when the kids got dressed up for Halloween, Kamaya Mobley should have been dressed up right next to him. That family photos always have a missing picture. And that photograph was taken not too long ago, Your Honor. As you can see, Kamaya Mobley is in it. And it's just a perfect example of what that family missed. What Kamaya Mobley missed, what Shannara Mobley missed, what Craig Aiken missed is a complete family for 18 years. It's priceless. It's beyond comprehension what this defendant stole. Benjamin Franklin said, lost time is never found again. Your Honor, there is no way you can replace what this defendant stole. However, your sentence can define what our society feels about what this defendant did. We are asking you to impose the 22 years in Florida State Prison, which is the maximum of the plea negotiation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mizrahi. <coughs>